certainly has been. I mean, there's two types of innovation that I see. There's the innovation that comes out of research and development, and I think Catalyst was a really good story about that, where we've really looked at the research, put together a new program model, rolling it out and evaluating it, and I think it will really contribute to the suite of services that will be available for clients in the future. So that's one type. But the other type that I'm also really interested in is what we call practice innovation, which is really just doing something better. So it's just where you see a gap or a need. We have, you have inquisitive staff who think about doing it differently, and you have organisations that have a culture that accepts experimentation. Yeah, in the, the reason I started the site in the first place was because I saw that there were colleagues of mine who didn't know some of the really basic stuff that I was doing with clients in needle exchange and in one-to-one -one sessions. So I decided that I was going to do a website that put those things out there for people to comment on and say how they would do things differently. And I think it's these, it is these little things. It's always the tiny stuff that gets forgotten. And we have all of these policies to talk about, you know, how long some, someone should be on methadone and all this sort of stuff. And we forget that there's the conversations that the work is having. And we need to make that more transparent and more public so that we can, other people can learn from it rather than just reading whatever the latest policy is. I think you see that with you know things like Wikipedia and um, in, in an online environment, not just in, in alcohol and drugs. There's there's such a collective consciousness, I guess you could call it, around knowledge and sharing that knowledge. And I think yeah, sites like yours and um, you know Hello Sunday Morning is not quite there, but the real focus around innovation is. How do you organise that knowledge in the best possible way? What's the best way of doing it and what's the metrics around doing that? And that's the reason why Google is so extraordinarily wealthy is because they're the first people to actually organise the internet well. Um, and I think you'll find the same thing will happen in any sector or any field is that the people that can organise innovation as well, be a hub like that, um, that can get the best knowledge to the right people at the right time will always be more successful. not supported by anybody with anything I was doing. For the first two years, I did it under an alias because the organization I worked for had a policy of, if you're going to say anything about drugs in the public forum, it has to go to a communications department, which will slow everything down. And you can't do that with social media because the conversation is happening now. Um, eventually, once the website became a big enough brand that my employer wouldn't sack me if I started saying stuff publicly. Then they got to know that I was doing it. But no, I have no support in that. I, I, I totally agree with David in the fact that innovation is contagious in, and recovery is contagious. So is harm reduction work. If you are working with a group of active users who aren't in recovery and who aren't even at the stage of considering recovery, then you can still use that contagion of sort of memes and ideas to get good harm reduction work out there and to get the concept of treatment as an option, recovery as a future option for them. And that I think is something that we need to be doing more. And we can do that with social media so much better than we ever could in a one-to-one -one session. Something that came to my mind as I was hearing this speak is the sense of frustration as a frontline practitioner that I often experience when dealing with clients trying to be the voice of reason. The clients come to our service, a lot of their reference points um, are based on what they hear in the media. We're often 
the clients are perceived and portrayed as deviants if they come to a drug treatment service. And so, so much of my time, or, and it's not just my time, is spent trying to redress what has been quite a shocking message that, you know, to use particularly illicit drugs is a deviant act. And one of the things I was thinking about in terms of innovation, and I'm just wanting to hear some comments about it, is given the technology is now available, we are now using the social media, do you see that we are now in a better position not only to provide services, but to act as advocates, which is going to hopefully reframe the debate, be a countervailing force to the shock jocks out there? I'm just wondering if, if you could just make some comments about that. Um, Rick, uh, Sam's keen to do it. Uh, yeah, yeah. So Sam, Sam let's start with you. Yeah, look, I, I, I totally agree about the reframing. Uh, you know, every one of these individuals is someone's son, daughter, nephew, niece, grandchild. And even a shock jock knows that. Um, I had some interesting experiences recently with a fellow who spoke to a shock jock. And what I've come to appreciate is the person at the other end of the, the microphone that's interviewing me, I, you know, indicated to me you had serious back injury at some point. And whenever it gets to pharmaceutical drugs, he becomes really interested in it. And he gives me an easy run every time I go on there. And so I'm able to actually push through stuff that talks about some of this reframing around in some of these drugs. And I think uh, we need to demonise our clients as much as we can get away and try and get away from that desperate energy to kill clients. I think that's where we want to the heart and mind of both the public and the Yeah, I, I'm 100% behind that. I think, um, you know, we have stories of people on there every day on, on Hello Sunday morning and watching. And I'm not a treatment worker, but the kind of culture that I think is in Hello Sunday morning and should be within mainstream media is around just understanding and being a good friend and not trying to put someone in a box of a particular choice that they make. Um, and... From our experience, you know, like that's worked really well. And I think if within government, I think you have these three to four year sort of cycles. You don't see the big changes that happen in people's lives when they go through the experience and the kind of depth of, of an experience that they have. So that's unfortunate when you talk about funding because it's like, oh, you don't, you don't actually see the longitudinal, much further out difference in terms of the impact on their families and things like that. that in a way, I think high viewers have people choose these experiences to get that understanding and that growth, and it's all part of life's journey. So the, the first thing I would say to, to answer your question is I don't think you should be so down about innovation in Victoria. I've been pretty impressed about that. I think there's a lot of interest in innovation stuff. Some of it we've heard about today. There's some interesting stuff that Turning Point does around getting out to people much before they come to us. Because one of the big solutions to your question, I think, is if you work in a treatment service, I used to do assessments in a, a clinic in South East London. By the time people come to you, they've got multiple complex morbidities, physical health, mental health, addictions, crime, all kinds of stuff. If you want to try and address that issue, getting to people early is a big, big challenge. So one of the ideas of, of having online services, telephone services, the range of things we have is potentially to access people before those fully fledged problems arise and to get to people uh, to offer a much broader range of services because effectively what we offer is reactive response services. They're limited births and providing a much wider range of innovative approaches, self-help, uh, peer-based, community-based intervention seems to me one of the things that you do well here and this is an innovative place in that area. And the other thing to say is, you know, if you want to challenge stigma, one of the major ways of doing it is by demonstrating success. And I think one of the ways of demonstrating success is both at a global level by, by making recovery visible, by making it apparent to people that there are large groups of people in visible recovery. And at a much more micro level, to make part of your process of your treatment system given back. So I've been involved in projects in Wales that were about having people 
dredging the river and uh, when they were doing recovery stuff, people in high visibility recovery jackets clearing snow from old people's houses. And it's that very local thing that starts to challenge the fundamental notion of addicts as a leech in society. So you create that higher visibility for recovery as a kind of positive social force that challenges stereotypes. Oh yeah, I mean the thing is, if you if you can build up a good brand with social media, then what you say becomes accepted far more readily. And if you look at things like there's a brilliant um, piece of video of a guy overdosing in Denmark, I think it is on YouTube. And if you look at the comments, there's a load of people talking rubbish about injecting adrenaline into the heart because they've seen it in Pulp Fiction. But then you get a lot more people going on there and being educators and talking about naloxone and talking about the need for naloxone provision and maybe even directing people to websites for more information that's accurate. So yeah, there are a lot of people out there. I was part of a, I was part of a conference the other day and I was really disappointed when someone was talking about social media that they never mentioned the work of people doing harm reduction and doing education with social media. It was all about the fact that Occasionally, somebody selling methadrone might just set up a Twitter account. 